Hello, this is Dr. Hana Asil, and this is a review on Unit 2 in the AS Chemistry at Excel. So, Unit 2 involved uh, energetics, group chemistry, halogenoalkanes, alcohols, and infrared spectroscopy. So, the first chapter was on chemical energetics, and this deals with the enthalpy change, and we said delta H is enthalpy change under standard conditions that is a hundred kilopascal pressure to 98 degree kelvin and concentration of solution one mole per decimeter cube this is what we mean by standard conditions and we usually do this in under standard state standard state is the physical state of a substance under standard conditions so we have different delta H's and you should know the definition of each standard enthalpy change. So standard enthalpy change of reaction is enthalpy change that takes place when the amount of reactants shown in the equation react to give products under standard conditions, reactants and products in their standard state. Notice that the definition for each of them will be very similar. Standard enthalpy change of formation, again, is the enthalpy change that takes place when. When what? We're talking about formation. One mole of a compound in its standard state is formed from its constituent elements. In their standard states, under standard conditions, remember that delta H formation of any element is zero. Now, if we have a reaction like this, the delta H for this reaction would be delta H formation of methane or delta H of formation of ethanol and so on. So, if we say which equation represents standard enthalpy change of formation for aluminum oxide, what was definition? We said it is the enthalpy change that takes place when one mole of a compound is formed. So I'm, I have in my equation, I should be forming one mole, not two moles. So C and D are wrong. And then I want to form it from its constituents in their standard state. So we have to form it from aluminium as a solid and O2 as a gas, not just O. So, the answer should be A. Standard enthalpy change of combustion is the enthalpy change that takes place when combustion, one mole of a substance is burned in excess oxygen under standard conditions, reactants and products in their standard state. So, the delta H for this equation would be the delta H of combustion of carbon Remember that the delta H of combustion for water and oxygen are equal to zero. Sometimes the same equation, the delta H for that equation could be two types of standard enthalpy change. For example, the delta H for this reaction, H2 plus O2 to give H2O, we can regard it as the delta H of combustion of hydrogen, or the delta H of formation of what? Standard enthalpy change of neutralization, again, is the enthalpy change that takes place when we're talking about neutralization. One mole of water is formed by reaction of an acid with an alkali under standard conditions. So the overall reaction is H plus plus OH minus to give water. Standard enthalpy change of atomization. What does that mean? Enthalpy change that takes place when one mole of gaseous atoms is formed from its elements. So I'm trying to form one mole of gaseous atoms, so I, for example, from its elements under standard conditions. So this is forming, forming that from iodine solid or forming one mole of chlorine gas from chlorine gas, one mole of bromine gas, you're forming one mole of gaseous atoms from its elements in the standard state. So bromine, for example, I'm trying to form 
one mole of gaseous bromine from bromine as a liquid because that's the standard condition for bromine or sodium gas from sodium solid that is the element in its standard state then we need to know what is bond energy bond energy is the enthalpy change needed to break and separate one mole of bonds in the molecules of a gaseous element or compound so the bond energy is the amount of energy needed to break a bond in one mole of a gaseous element or compound the mean bond enthalpy is the average energy required to break one mole of a bond of molecules in the gaseous state so if we have this kind of question the mean cf bond enthalpy so the energy needed to break a cf bond is plus 485 which process has an enthalpy change of plus 1940 now remember that each cf bond needs 485 so if i have 1940 that means i'm breaking four bonds where are we breaking four bonds here so this is in c the enthalpy level diagram for a reaction is shown which is represented by this diagram again is this diagram for exothermic or endothermic remember when the products have less energy than reactants this is exothermic which of these is exothermic changing sodium solid to sodium gas this is atomization changing sodium gas to sodium ions this is called ionization when we join two chlorine to form cl2 this is the bond enthalpy this will give out the amount of energy needed to break that bond or it's the amount of energy uh, given out when uh, a bond is formed of course that last one is just dissolving so this has nothing to do with what if we have this kind of question it says the enthalpy changes for conversion of four compounds into the gaseous state uh, into their uh, constituent atoms is shown and we have the delta h for breaking up of water the bonds in water the bonds in methane the bonds in methanol the bonds in ethanol calculate the bond enthalpy of the carbon carbon bond now which of these has carbon carbon bonds that's the last one ethanol but in order to get the carbon carbon bonds i need to know the energy needed to break carbon hydrogen and carbon oxygen and um, oxygen hydrogen so if we look at the information we have that first equation gives delta h to break water but water has two oh bonds so to get the bond enthalpy for one oh bond it will be half of that delta h what if we look at the next equation it is giving me the delta h to break four ch bonds so if i want the bond enthalpy to break one ch bond i divide that by four methanol methanol has carbon and hydrogen carbon and oxygen and oxygen and hydrogen so i already got c uh, h and oh so i can use this to get the other two bonds in a co so the difference between them will be the um, bond enthalpy for the co now i can look at the delta h for that last equation that involves breaking up of one cc bond five ch bonds one co bond and one oh bond using all the above information i can get the bond enthalpy for the carbon carbon bond and that is what we get another question calculate a value for the enthalpy change of combustion using the information given so we're given the amount of energy needed to break each of these bonds now i take a look how many of each of these do i have 
I have three CH bonds, uh, one CO bond, one OH bond, and one and a half of the O double bond O. This is in the reactants. And in the products, we have this. And remember that the delta H is reactants minus products. So the delta H overall for this reaction is minus 658. That was one method of getting delta H. Bond enthalpies of reactants minus bond enthalpies of products. But we could do that using a different method in which we do a reaction and we get the total quantity of heat, which is Q. Q is mc delta T. M is the mass of the solution, which would be the same as the volume. And C is the specific heat capacity, which is 4.18. It's a constant. And the temperature change. This I can use to get Q. And then I can get delta H is Q over the number of modes. Remember that the value that we calculate is usually different from the value in the data book. This may be due to what? You have to know how to explain at least two of these. Usually when I do the experiment, I get heat loss from the apparatus or heat loss to the surroundings. Uh, I could have incomplete combustion if I'm trying to burn a fuel or I could have evaporation of the fuel, so the mass that was actually burned is not correct. Or we could say that some of the heat is absorbed by the calorimeter itself, the apparatus that we use, or that the measurements are not carried out under standard conditions if uh, we want a, another explanation. So for example, this experiment to determine the entropy change of combustion of ethanol. We have ethanol in a spirit burner and we're using it to heat a specific amount of water, in this case 100 grams. And we know the mass of ethanol because we're going to measure the mass of the spirit burner at the beginning and then measure it at the end and the difference would be the mass of ethanol that was actually burned. And I'm going to measure the initial and final temperatures so I can get the temperature rise. Now from all of these, we're required to calculate the entropy change of combustion. So Q is mc delta T. We said m is the mass of the water. If it is given in centimeter cubed, you still use it as if it is grams because we regard density of water as one. And that means the volume is the same as the mass. Mass of water is 100, C is a constant, it's 4.18 times the temperature change that we're given. This is the total amount of energy in joules, the quantity of heat in joules. Then we need delta H, we need delta H, delta H is, we said it's Q over N, so I need to get the molecular mass of ethanol. Then we can get the number of moles of ethanol mass over molecular mass. The mass of the ethanol used is what we measured from or was given in the uh, question over the MR. This is the number of moles of ethanol that was burnt. Then delta H is Q over N. Please remember, delta H must have a sign. Now, is this positive or negative? Well, we look at the information. The information tells me that there is a temperature rise. That means the temperature of the water went up. When something has a temperature rise, that means this is an exothermic reaction. And besides, anyway, we're talking about uh, enthalpy change of combustion. Enthalpy change of combustion must be exothermic and that means it must have a negative sign. Then you should know that throughout our syllabus we will be required to calculate percent uncertainty. So we were given a temperature rise in the question. Now the question says the uncertainty in each thermometer reading is plus or minus 0.05. That means if I am 
measuring a temperature every time i measure the temperature there is an uncertainty of plus or minus 0.05 but remember that when we measure temperature rise that means i measured the initial temperature and then the final temperature so we're actually using the thermometer twice and that means the percent uncertainty will be twice of the 0 0.05 over the value that we're measuring so we were given the temperature rise as 13.2 times 100 that gives me the percentage uncertainty plus or minus something okay another question on that same experiment the student looked in data book and found the actual value for the standard entropy change of combustion was more exothermic than the experimental value so they got a higher value than what we got give two reasons for the difference between the data book value and the experimental value again when we're given something like this we said the value we get is usually lower than what it should be why because there is heat loss to the surroundings or there was incomplete combustion of ethanol if i want a third one i could say some of the ethanol evaporated before we weighed the mass so actually the mass that we weighed is not actually uh, what was burnt now they would usually ask you to draw a graph or they will draw a graph and ask you to get information from it so a student carried out an investigation to determine the enthalpy change of neutralization this is enthalpy change of neutralization they separate they uh, put separate 25 centimeter samples of 0.8 mole per decimeter cube sodium hydroxide and uh, this uh, concentration of hydrochloric acid and so they're adding sodium hydroxide to hydrochloric acid and please notice that they added 25 of sodium hydroxide and 25 of hydrochloric acid after two minutes the solution were mixed in a copper uh, calorimeter and the temperature was noted and they were given a graph the first thing you need to know is you need to get the delta t from the graph so we're not given the delta t we are asked to get it from the graph now when i have a graph like this how do i get it remember that it says after two minutes the solutions were mixed that means at the beginning i had a temperature of uh, whatever that is 25 or something 23 um, and then we have a value and this is how you get the uh, temperature rise you join with a straight line the first points the first few points you join with another straight line the other points and then we said after two minutes the solutions were mixed so that vertical line has to be at two minutes which is 120 seconds and from there we can get the delta t do we understand this okay and then the question says calculate the enthalpy change of neutralization using these uh, information what we said was we added 25 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide to 0 point uh, and 25 again of the hydrochloric acid and this was the delta t we calculated from the graph we know that in order to get the enthalpy change of neutralization i have to get q first so q is mc delta t now what is m remember we added 25 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide to 25 centimeter cubed of hcl that means the total mass is 50 times the specific heat capacity sometimes it's given as 4.18 and sometimes given as 4.2 doesn't make a difference the delta t we got from the graph and what comes out from this equation is in, is in joules we usually divide by a thousand to change it to kilojoules so that i can use it to get the delta h now the delta h is q over n and you can see that if we write the equation for neutralization of sodium hydroxide with hcl it's a one-to-one -one ratio 
So, the number of moles of water is the concentration times the volume, the concentration of any of them times the volume. So, concentration of 0.8, for example, times the volume was 25 of HCl, for example. Then, this is the 0 0.02 mole of water because it is equal to number of moles of HCl. And then, delta H would be this over the number of moles of water. Remember, this was a temperature rise, so the delta H is a negative value. Explain how, if at all, the enthalpy change of neutralization obtained in that reaction would differ if the heat capacity of the calorimeter was included. Remember, we put only the heat capacity of the water, which is 4.2. But you should realize, what is heat capacity anyway? Specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of 1 kilogram by 1 degree Celsius. And what we do is we include the heat capacity of the water. We do not include the heat capacity of the calorimeter. So if we are going to include the heat capacity of the calorimeter, that means the value for C in Q equals MC delta T would be higher. And that means the Q would be higher. And that means the enthalpy change of neutralization would be higher or more exothermic since the total heat capacity would be great. Please keep all of these types of questions in mind. An experiment, this is another experiment now, enthalpy change of combustion for ethanol. We're starting with 1.19 grams of ethanol. The heat energy from this combustion raised the temperature of 100 grams of water from this to that. Calculate, first of all, the number of moles of ethanol. Of course, the number of moles is the mass over the molecular mass of ethanol and then calculate the heat energy. Remember, heat energy is Q. So, Q is mc delta T. So, that gives me the Q in joules and then divide by 1000 to get it in kilojoule. Now, when we're doing delta H, delta H would be the Q over the N. The N, remember, is the number of moles of the ethanol. So, this value, again, there was a temperature rise, and this value has to be a negative value. Again, if he says the value of the entropy change of combustion was very inaccurate, give two reasons why it's inaccurate apart from heat loss. So, don't say heat loss to the surroundings. We can say incomplete combustion, so less energy is released, or some of the ethanol evaporate. Okay, and then we use Hess's law to get delta H's that we don't know. So, Hess's law says if I'm starting from a reactant to a product in two different routes, then the total enthalpy change for one route is equal to the enthalpy change of the other. So, for example, you will have many questions like this in which we're given the enthalpy changes for two reactions. What is the enthalpy change for this Fe2O3 plus 3 carbon to give 2 iron plus 3 CO. So, we're trying to get the delta H of this. And notice that the delta H is given above are actually the delta H of formation of each of these. So, the first equation given up there is the delta H of formation of Fe2O3. And the second one is the delta H of formation of the CO. So, I can use this in a Hess's cycle in which I'm starting down there from the elements in their standard state. I'm forming Fe2O3. Remember that forming of carbon, delta H of formation of an element is zero. So, I don't have delta H of formation for, a cor for carbon and I don't have delta H formation for iron. Because we said we don't have delta H of formation for elements. Now, going one way, I will be equal to the other. So, the delta H that I want uh, plus the one on the left. So, the one on the left plus delta H is equal to the one on the right. And I can use that to get the delta H required. Okay. 
Then the second chapter is about intermolecular forces. And you should remember if we're comparing solids, liquids, gases, the solids have stronger intermolecular forces. That's why the molecules are nearer to each other than liquid, than gases. Now, if we're talking about something like ionic compounds, there is very strong intermolecular forces because these are forces between positive and negative ions in giant three-dimensional structure. So a lot of energy is needed to break them apart. And that means that ionic compounds have high melting or boiling points. Metals also have high melting point, And this is because strong electrostatic attraction forces between what? positive ions and negative delocalized electrons. We're talking about metals. And of course, the more the delocalized electrons, the stronger the attraction forces, the higher the melting point. So aluminium, which has three electrons per positive ion, would have higher melting point than magnesium and magnesium higher than sodium. When we talk about a giant three-dimensional covalent compounds like diamond and graphite. These have strong covalent bonds in a giant three-dimensional structure or giant macromolecular structure. All of these need a lot of energy to be broken. So again, diamond and graphite have high melting point. But if we're talking about simple molecular structures, they're not giant. All simple molecular structures have weak London dispersion forces, or we call them van der Waals forces. So this is a basic type of intermolecular forces that is present between all simple molecular structures. If they have only London dispersion forces, nothing else, then they will have very low melting point. So for example, a chlorine molecule, uh, we have London dispersion forces between them, which are weak and easily broken. Now, how do we explain the presence of the London dispersion forces or the van der Waals forces? These are caused by the molecules, when they come near to each other, they distort each other's electron cloud, so this electron cloud, electrons accumulate on one side. So it causes what we call instantaneous temporary dipole. So one side will be slightly positive, one side will be slightly negative. And these opposite charges attract. This is a very weak attraction force. So these kinds of molecules would have very low melting point. Now, what if we have different molecules? All of them have London forces. Well, the greater the number of electrons, the larger the induced dipoles, so the greater London forces, so the melting point or boiling point would increase. So going from fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. If we're asked what is the intermolecular forces in each one, it is just weak. London forces or weak van der Waals forces. Now, if we're saying which one has higher boiling point, well, it's the one that has more electrons. So as we go down group seven, the melting point increases. So if we're looking at this, the molecule with the strongest London forces is which one? We said the strongest London forces will be the one that has more electrons, larger molecules. So this is CF4. Uh, this one has two uh, fluorines and one chlorine. This one has two chlorines. Now that last one has an iodine and the iodine is larger than the other halogens. So this would have stronger London forces between its molecules. Which of these alkanes has the highest boiling temperature? Again, the one that is bigger with more electrons. So in this case, comparing all of these, it is the hexane. 
that has a bigger molecule, more electrons, so more uh, London or stronger London forces. These were molecules that don't have electronegative elements, but if I have an electronegative element like oxygen, then we have what is called permanent dipole-dipole interactions. So if we have polar molecules in which oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so the oxygen will have slightly negative charge, carbon slightly positive, then these molecules will have permanent dipole-dipole interactions in addition to London dispersion forces. Please remember that. They still have some London dispersion forces between them, but they also have permanent dipole-dipole, which are stronger than the London forces. So this would have a higher melting point than something that doesn't have anything else than London forces. Now, if we have electronegative elements bonded to hydrogen, then the molecules between them can form what we call hydrogen bonds. So water, for example, has a boiling point that's higher than normal uh, simple molecular structures because it can form hydrogen bonds. Ethanol would have a higher uh, boiling point than something that has the same number of carbons and uh, or the same molecular mass that does not form hydrogen bond. The one with hydrogen bond would have higher melting point. So, which intermolecular forces exist between this molecule? Now, this is a molecule that has C double bond O. We said the C double bond O would form permanent dipole dipole interactions. But I also have an OH, and the OH can form hydrogen bonding with the others. And we said the hydrogen bonding is stronger than the permanent dipoles. And we also have, in addition to all of this, we said all the simple molecules have London forces. So this kind of molecule actually has all three of them. Hydrogen bonding, because it has hydrogen bonded to oxygen, an electronegative element. It has permanent dipole, permanent dipole forces, because it has C double bond O. The oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon, so there is partial positive and partial negative. And, of course, we said all simple molecules have London forces. This question says some diesel cars contain an uh, extra catalytic converter and so on. We have a, a solution of urea, and the question says urea has a melting temperature of 133. Explain why this value is higher than expected. Why does this have a relatively high uh, melting temperature? Of course, this is because it has permanent dipoles between the C and the double bond O, and it has hydrogens bonded to an electronegative element, which is nitrogen, so it can form hydrogen bonds. So urea forms strong hydrogen bonds and it has permanent dipole-dipole interactions on the C double bond O in addition to the weak London dispersion forces. If we're comparing ethanol with ethane, we said ethanol can form hydrogen bond while ethane would have only weak van der Waals forces or London forces so the melting point of ethanol would be higher. If we're saying water, we said, why does water have a relatively high boiling point? Because it has hydrogen bonded to an electronegative oxygen, so the molecules can form hydrogen bonds between them. And actually, you should know that each water molecule can form two hydrogen bonds with surrounding mo water molecules. You should know that the density of ice is lower than that of water. Remember, when water freezes, the ice floats on top of the water. This is because in order to change from liquid to solid, the molecules should come nearer to each other. But in water, the molecules cannot come nearer to each other because they start forming hydrogen bonding between the water molecules, and this prevents prevents them from coming any nearer to each other, so the ice is not 
as dense as what? So if we say this question, which is not correct about ice, ice has lower density than water, we just said that. Water molecules are further apart in ice than in water. Yes, we said water molecules are further apart because of the hydrogen bonding and that is why uh, ice is lower density than water. Then when it says the HOH bond angle is the same in ice and in water, this is the one that is not correct. Remember that in water, the bond angle, we said water is nonlinear, the bond angle is 104.5. But when it comes nearer to each other, it becomes trigonal planar. Trigonal planar is 120. So actually the bond angle in ice is larger than that in water. And when it says water molecules in ice are held together by hydrogen bonds, that of course is a correct statement. Alkanes with branch chains have lower boiling point than straight chains. So both of these molecules have weak van der Waals forces or weak London forces between the molecules. Then why is it that one has higher boiling point than the other? Remember, a straight chain can pack more tightly with other straight chains than the branched chain. So when they are packed more tightly, they have greater intermolecular forces and this requires higher temperature to be broken or it needs more energy to be broken. So remember that if we're talking about simple molecular structures, the London dispersion is weaker than dipole-dipole and the dipole-dipole is weaker than the hydrogen bonds. So the strongest is the hydrogen bonds. But when we're talking about giant molecules, remember that the metallic has stronger than the covalent giant and that is stronger than the ionic bonds. So if we say which row in the table shows the forces between molecules in the liquid state. So we have four different molecules and we're required to determine which type of forces are present between the molecules. So BF3. BF3 has a non-polar molecule. It has individual uh, dipoles in each um, molecule but these cancel in each bond but these cancel each other in the three bonds so overall the molecule is non-polar remember that any of these simple molecules would have London forces so when we say no it doesn't have London forces that is wrong and when we say it has um, hydrogen bonding that is wrong now, methane, what is uh, the intermolecular forces between methane? Remember that methane would have London dispersion forces. We said all simple molecular uh, structures have London dispersion forces, but we don't have permanent dipole and we don't have hydrogen bonding. So when it says CH4 has hydrogen bonding, that is wrong. Now, Methane, what kind of interactions do we have in methane? Of course, we said, again, it has London forces, but it also has permanent dipoles between nitrogen and hydrogen. Nitrogen is more electronegative and it has hydrogen bonding. So what is written in that table is wrong. What about H2S? H2S would have London forces and it would have permanent dipole and it can form Hi, uh, it cannot form, sorry, hydrogen bonding between the molecules. So that is the correct. Uh, remember that sulfur is not that electronegative, so it would not form hydrogen bond. Which of the following has the highest melting temperature? Again, we're comparing what? Mercury. Well, mercury is a liquid metal. Potassium is solid but potassium is group one so that is also high but we remember the group one we said are soft metals c10h22 is a non-polar uh, straight chain molecule 
this would have only London dispersion forces between the molecules. So this is very low. The silicon dioxide, we said, is giant, three-dimensional, uh, with many, many covalent bonds that are strong. So this is actually the one with the highest melting temperature. Which of these compounds would be expected to have the highest boiling temperature? Again, what are we comparing? We're comparing butanol, propanol, uh, propane to all. Anything that has an OH bonded, uh, an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen, these can form hydrogen bonding. So butanol, uh, butane one all, two methyl, uh, propane one all, two methyl, propane two all. All of these are alcohols that would have hydrogen bonding. So they're, all of these would have higher boiling temperatures than pentane. So actually out of all of these, pentane is the lowest. Now looking at all of those that have OH, we said which one would have higher melting point or boiling point. Remember we said the one with a straight chain would have higher boiling temperature than the others, especially if all of them have the same number of carbons. Which sequence shows the molecules in order of increasing boiling temperature? Well, which one has higher boiling temperature? Remember that these are the choices we have. Methane would have only weak van der Waals forces. So actually methane is the lowest and then chlorine and bromine. Remember we said bromine is our bigger molecules. Both of them have weak van der Waals forces or weak London dispersion forces. But the bromine would be higher because it has more electrons. And of course, water is something that forms hydrogen bond. So actually, that last sequence is showing the increasing boiling temperature. Solubilities, which compounds dissolve in what? You should know that ionic compounds dissolve in water because the ions can form interactions with positive and negative ends of the water. So ionic compounds dissolve in water. If something can do hydrogen bonding with water, it will also dissolve. So ethanol or alcohols would dissolve in water because they can form hydrogen bonds. So if we say draw a hydrogen bond between water and pentanol, I want you to remember that the hydrogen bond has to be linear with a bond angle of 180 degrees. So this is how we draw a hydrogen bond. Now, if we have something that is nonpolar, then the nonpolar will dissolve in nonpolar or polar will dissolve in polar. So, acetone, for example, is polar, it dissolves, non uh, it, it dissolves the polar compounds, while benzene is nonpolar, it would dissolve nonpolar, like dissolves like. So, if we say cyclohexane is nonpolar, therefore, which of these would happen? Okay, we're saying sodium chloride will dissolve. Remember, cyclohexane is nonpolar. Sodium chloride is ionic. It would not dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. Cyclohexane conducts electricity? No, we don't have any free electrons or free ions. A jet of cyclohexane is deflected. Remember that. When we have a liquid coming down from a burette or a, a structure like this, now, what do we mean by deflected by charged rod? Well, if it is polar, then it will be deflected by a charged rod. But if it is a nonpolar liquid, it would not be deflected. So cyclohexane, we said, is nonpolar, so it would not be deflected. Cyclohexane forms two layers when mixed with water. That is the one that is correct because remember we said cyclohexane is nonpolar, so it will not dissolve in water. It cannot form hydrogen bonds and it is nonpolar, then it will not dissolve in water, so it will form two layers with water. Which solvent dissolves hydrocarbon C35? Now remember that C35H72 is a nonpolar. Um, molecule, so it would not dissolve in things that are polar like alcohols or acids, but it would dissolve in something that is also nonpolar, so the hydrocarbons dissolve in hexane. 
The next part is about oxidation reduction reactions. Remember from previous uh, studies, oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons, and a redox involves both. So, if we have this equation, we said the iron loses electrons, so that is oxidation. The copper 2 plus will gain electrons, so that is reduction. So, if we say which element is oxidized and which is reduced when calcium reacts with water, we're going to say that calcium, when it reacts with water, it forms calcium hydroxide plus hydrogen. What happened to the calcium? It changed to calcium 2 plus, that is oxidation. The hydrogen changed from H2O to H2, that means it lost oxygen, and that means it was reduced. Which reaction is not a redox reaction? Remember that um, if we're changing KClO3 to KClO4, well, that is actually um, oxidation. If we're changing HCl plus barium hydroxide, this is acid plus base. Acid plus base is not a redox reaction. It is a neutralization reaction. Zinc plus copper sulfate to give zinc ions plus copper. Of course, the zinc has been oxidized and the copper has been reduced. Chlorine plus water, again, this is an oxidation reaction or a redox reaction except for B. Now, if we have a redox reaction, then we have an oxidizing agent and that was the substance that was reduced. So, in an equation, the one that is reduced is the oxidizing. Other examples of oxidizing agents, if we're trying to oxidize something, for example, oxidizing an alcohol, I can either add potassium permanganate, which originally has purple color and it would turn to colorless when it reacts. Potassium dichromate is originally orange. If it reacts, it turns to green. So these are oxidizing agents that I can use to oxidize something. And a reducing agent is the substance that gains oxygen or loses electrons. So it is the substance that was oxidized. So remember, reducing was the one that was oxidized. But if we're talking about examples of reducing agents, I can use hydrogen or carbon or carbon monoxide when we're trying to reduce a substance. So in this question, which uh, copper species is acting as an oxidizing agent. Again, we said oxidizing agent means it is reduced. So where is it reduced? Well, that first one, it changed from copper 2 plus to copper. That is reduction. The others will not be the correct answer. Ionic half reactions. Remember that we can write ionic half equations and balance them. So, if I have Fe3 uh, plus reacting with nickel, now I have the Fe3 plus will gain electrons and become Fe2 plus, the nickel will lose electrons and become nickel 2 plus. Now, in order to add these two equations, I have to have the same number of electrons. So, I multiplied that upper equation all through by 2 so that the number of electrons in the two half equations would be the same then the electrons will be cancelled and the overall reaction is the addition of whatever is before the arrow and whatever is after the arrow. So if we have this, two half equations for a reaction are shown. What is the overall ionic equation? Well, let's take a look at it. The first one gives two electrons, the second one uses up three electrons. The number of electrons should be the same. So what can I do to make the number of electrons the same? Well, I can multiply the one up all through by 3 and the one down all through by 2. Then I can cancel the electrons, write whatever is left before the arrow and after the arrow. And that means that this is the correct answer. What is the value of n in the half equation? So basically, we're trying to balance. So we need to balance. We have O2 plus two oxygens before the arrow. So I need a total of four oxygens before the arrow. So the four OH minus. 
and that means I have four negatives after the arrow so I will need four negatives before the arrow so it is four electrons. So what about this question? It says which is the ionic equation for the reaction of solid barium carbonate with dibute hydrochloric acid? So we're starting with barium carbonate and hydrochloric acid and we want to write the ionic equation. Well, we write the normal symbol balanced equation. Remember, carbonates plus acids give salt plus carbon dioxide plus water. And then we ionize anything that is aqueous. So the barium carbonate is a solid. It remains as it is. But HCl is aqueous. All acids are aqueous. So 2H plus plus 2Cl minus to give barium chloride, which is aqueous. So barium 2 plus plus 2 chloride plus carbon dioxide, which is a gas, water, which is a liquid. We said solid, liquid, gases are copied as they are. We ionize only what is aqueous, and then we cancel what is the same on both sides of the arrow. So we have two chloride ions on both sides of the arrow that would be canceled. So this third equation is the final overall ionic equation, and that is similar to the choice in A. Oxidation number. You should be able to uh, calculate oxidation number because you know that oxidation is increase in oxidation number. Uh, reduction is decrease in oxidation number. And you should know that oxidation number uh, indicates the degree of oxidation or loss of electrons of an atom in a compound. Now, to assign oxidation numbers, remember, the sum of all atoms in a neutral molecule should come to zero. So the sum of all the oxidation numbers of atoms in a neutral molecule, if the molecule does not have overall positive or negative, then the total is zero. And the oxidation number of any element is zero. So oxidation number of nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and so on, any element is zero. If we have anything in group 1, its oxidation number is plus 1. Remember that group 1 has one electron atom shell. It needs to lose it. Oxidation number is actually the number of electrons lost or gained in order to have a full outer shell. So anything in group 1 has oxidation number plus 1. Group 2 is plus 2. Group 3 is plus 3. Group 0 is 0. Anything else can be variable. So if we're looking at potassium bromide, potassium is in group 1. So it's plus 1, that means the Br is minus 1. Magnesium oxide, oxygen is plus 2, uh, sorry, magnesium is plus 2 and the oxygen is minus 2. Now what about oxidation number of hydrogen? It is usually plus 1. So HCl, the hydrogen is plus 1, Cl is minus 1, overall 0. In water, each hydrogen is plus 1, the oxygen is minus 2, overall 0. But in some cases, hydrogen cannot be plus 1. For example, sodium hydride. Sodium is in group 1 and we said sodium has to be plus 1. So in this case, hydrogen is minus 1. Or in group 2, we said anything in group 2 is plus 2. So each hydrogen has to be minus 1 in order to have an overall zero. Now, what about oxygen? The overall, usually, oxygen has oxidation number minus two. So, for example, carbon dioxide. Carbon is in group four, so the each oxygen is minus two and the carbon is plus four to have an overall of zero, except in specific examples. So, peroxides, hydrogen peroxide, the total has to be zero. So if each hydrogen is plus one, then each oxygen has to be minus one in order to have a total zero. Um, in uh, superoxides, in superoxides like KO2, the total has to be zero. And we know that it, the K has to be plus one. So that means each, each oxygen is minus half. In OF2, the total has to be zero. So if each fluorine has to be minus 1, then the oxygen has to be plus 2. So these are exceptions. Otherwise, oxygen is minus 2. 
the sum of the oxidation numbers of an atomic group is the charge on the group. So, for example, nitrate, the total has to be minus 1. So, if oxygen, each oxygen is minus 2, then the nitrogen has to be plus 5 minus 6, that would be overall minus 1. Here, carbonate has two minus, so the total oxidation number is minus two. If each oxygen is minus two, that means I have minus six. The carbon has to be plus four in order to have an overall of minus two, and so on. The total is the charge and oxygen is minus two, so determine the oxidation number of the other element. Okay? For example, chlorine gas may be prepared by heating concentrated hydrochloric acid with solid manganese oxide. Show by reference to oxidation number that it is a redox. Remember, manganese dioxide. What is the oxidation number of Mn? If each oxygen is minus 2, that means we have minus 4, so the Mn has to be plus 4 so that the overall is 0. Now, it changed to MnCl2. Well, each Cl is minus 1, and that means I have a total of minus 2, so the Mn has to be plus 2. So, this is change from plus 4 to plus 2. This is what we call reduction. Remember, reduction is decrease in oxidation number. What about the Cl? In H, Cl, the H is plus 1, so the Cl has to be minus 1. Now, Cl2, we said the oxidation number of any element is 0. And that means the chlorine change from minus 1 to 0. This is increase in oxidation number. So this is oxidation. What is the oxidation number of phosphorus in the phosphate ion? Again, we said the total has to be the charge on top. So the total is minus 3. Each oxygen is minus 2. And that means if we calculate it, then the X has to be, or the phosphorus has to be, plus 5. How does an oxidizing agent change? Remember we said the oxidizing agent is the one that is reduced, and the reducing agent is the one that is oxidized. So here, for example, the oxidizing agent is the one that is reduced, uh, reduction means gain of electrons. So the substance that was reduced is the one that gained electrons or it is the one in which the oxidation number decreased. Remember in that equation that I have, oxidation number of copper changed from plus 2 to 0. So this is decrease in oxidation number. What is disproportionation reactions? Remember that a disproportionation reaction is one in which one specific species is both oxidized and reduced. So in this equation, for example, oxidation number of Cl2 element, zero. In NaCl, the sodium is group one plus one, so the Cl has to be minus one. What about in the NaClO? Each Na is plus 1 and the oxygen is minus 2, so the Cl has to be plus 1. And that means in the same reaction, chlorine changed from 0 to minus 1, that is decrease, that is reduction. And it also changed from 0 to plus 1, and that is oxidation. So the same species, chlorine, is both oxidized and reduced in the same reaction. This is called a disproportionation reaction. Again, this is another example of a disproportionation reaction in which chlorine changes from 0 to minus 1, so that is reduction, and from 0 to plus 5, and that is oxidation. Again, this is another example. Chlorine changed from 0 to minus 1 and from 0 to plus 1. All of these are called disproportionation reactions. So if we have a question like this, explain in terms of oxidation numbers of iodine in the three species why this is not a disproportionation reaction. Well, let's take a look at the oxidation numbers of each one. Iodine in IO3 minus is plus 5. It changed to what? To I2, that's 0. So that is reduction. In I minus, it changed from minus 1 
to zero, that is oxidation. But is this disproportionation? No. We are starting with two different things. Remember, in the disproportionation, we are starting with one substance. And then, in the reaction, it was oxidized and it was reduced. Here we are starting with two different species, different oxidation numbers are oxidized and reduced to give the same species. That's the opposite of disproportionation. In disproportionation, I should start with one species oxidized and reduced to form after the arrow two different species. Okay, we're going to stop here for this first part of the review and uh, we'll meet in the second part of the review on unit two. Thank you for listening.